So I'm here today with Sofia Vasilyeva, who is the founder of the Adult Children of Alcoholics Workshop. And she is also a doctoral candidate and is actually in the process of publishing a book, which I'm really excited to talk about. So thanks so much for being here, Sophia, and talking with me. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, this is awesome. I'm so glad this worked out. Yeah. So let's just dive right in and just kind of tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm the creator, like you said, of an eight-week workshop for adult children of alcohol. And the reason why I created this workshop is because, one, I'm an adult child of an alcoholic myself, and it was only later on in life that um, I started identifying some symptoms that I was experiencing and some problems that I was having in, in my life um, and started connecting it back to my childhood. And at some point, I learned about this, you know, adult ch children of alcoholic symptoms, and I learned about the 12-step programs, I learned about Al-Anon. And so I started attending the Al-Anon meetings, and I absolutely loved it. I found them to be so helpful, really loved being a part of that community. And once I started doing some of that work, um, things kind of started making more sense to me. Things started, you know, kind of falling into place. I was also doing a lot of personal therapy work, and I also entered into graduate training for clinical psychology. And so at some point in my graduate training in clinical psychology, I also started to work with people, and I found that I really gravitate towards working with people that are struggling with addictions and also working with people who have come from, um, you know, traumatic background. So whether it, it was people where maybe, you know, grew up in homes where alcohol or drugs were abused or any other kind of dysfunctional family situations, I guess in a way, you know, it's something that I've already been, been through. So I found it, um, you know, I found that I really enjoy working with these types of folks. And so I, I came to this idea to build this workshop because, um, you know, I think the Al-Anon or, or the ACO programs are really wonderful, but they're just not for everyone. You know, it's, it, well, first of all, it's a major time commitment. You know, you, you really have to have time to attend these meetings, which, you know, I always recommend people do, but I totally understand that in today's world, it just gets really difficult sometimes to consistently go and attend these meetings. Um, I think it's good to just like drop in. Also, the philosophy behind the 12 steps also, you know, particularly, I think some people have difficulty with, um, you know, the idea of higher power, God, things like that. So, you know, that aspect is not for everybody and, um, you know, sort of other things. So what I what I did is I took all the things, you know, from that program that I found super useful, as well as my personal experience working with clients as well as my personal experience, as well as just the research and all the literature that I read on the topic. And I just narrowed it down. So I tried to just like condense, you know, take all this information and just like really condense it to just give you points like boom, 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 boom. And then also created worksheets. So, you know, when I work with folks doing like one-on-one -on -one coaching or working in a therapeutic setting, there's particular things that I work through with people um, that really helps, you know, when you're doing it together, but it's also something that you can do on your own. So sitting down, challenging beliefs, doing a lot of journaling. So I like to give, you know, a lot of homework, a lot of journaling exercises, and all these things are meant to um, help build greater awareness and also change some of the patterns. That's what, what people are looking to do. Wow, that's that's phenomenal. I mean, so you actually have personal experience with growing up in a home of, of alcohol addiction, and you sort of just saw it as a call to action to help people who have a shared experience. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, one of my like philosophy and this is something that I also really like to share with people is sometimes um, 
you can also look at your your shadow side. So for me, growing up in an alcoholic home, I developed a lot of kind of codependent behaviors. So helping other people, taking care of others. Um, I think you know people that grow up in dysfunctional alcoholic homes, we almost build like a very strong sixth sense, a very strong feeling of empathy. We kind of know intuitively what's going on with people. We're able to pick up on those emotions, right. and I think. You know, it's a really beautiful thing. Like, it's actually, it's definitely a gift unless it's used in a way that is destructive for you. So if you're using this gift and you're taking care of somebody that, you know, kind of uses your, you know, your kindness and your empathy and your understanding of them to continue on being enabled to, you know, also do the drugs or drink the alcohol or whatever addictive behaviors you fall into, you're not listening to yourself. You're just being kind of like good for the world and not really building your own life, not working towards your own future. Then that's kind of destructive, right? And so I, you know, I have a tendency to do that. And so at, at some point in life, I came to this, you know, idea that okay, I have a tendency to do that. It's something that I'm definitely going to continue on doing, like helping people, caretaking uh, people, and it's something that makes me feel fulfilled. So I'm actually going to use that in a way that's beneficial. So I still have that energy. I still have that empathy. I still have that desire to care for other people. But I'm going to, instead of using it destructively, I'm going to use it positively. I'm going to use it towards a way that's beneficial. So I went to get, you know, real training to become a clinical psychologist, to really learn how to work with people. I did a lot of personal work. And so, you know, I have that experience and then I use that sort of that shadow side, you know, and, and, and turn it into um, a positive. And I really recommend that. I, and I see this a lot that, you know, people from kind of dysfunctional families that develop this caretaking, um, you know, this caretaking desire, it's such a beautiful thing. And we so need this in the world. And there's so many professions where people can, you know, go out and sort of use that energy um, right. for the better of humanity. So. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure anyone listening to this right now would, including myself, be able to identify with everything you just said. I mean, I've, I've always tried to pride myself on being like a sensitive person um and and at some point realizing that part of it is probably due to what i experienced growing up um but yeah it creates a lot of problems too in my life and i i would imagine i'm not alone and it, it's part of sort of this it, it's sort of a symptom of growing up in chaos and you know in fear and in trauma and um, obviously codependency is a part of that. And something that I've been learning more about, which I, it sounds like this is related to what you're describing, sounds like insecure attachment, right? Which is essentially relationships that are based on fear, right? And um, so how do you help, how do you help people developed develop more healthy attachments with people yeah so um the the, the insecure attach attachment styles um which is uh um so the, the attachment styles that are not secure attached so that would be anxious anxious attached avoidant attached and um, fearful disorganized attached and then each one of these attachments also has their own kind of set of degrees as well. Um, and people don't fit perfectly into any of these categories. Right. So the way, and, and, you know, usually when somebody has a, one of the, these kind of insecure attachments, you go back in their history, you will see um, some form of trauma, childhood abuse, whether it was from their, their, their family, or it could have even been something like, um, undergoing surgery or um, experiencing, you know, uh, an illness as as children, or maybe coming from uh, a war-torn country, 
or something directly from their parents. So if people want to earn a secure attachment style, and by the way, I think that, you know, sometimes people fall into relationships, they both have an insecure attachment style and they're totally okay with it. Like, Two people are preoccupied and they happen to find each other and they're like always oh, anxious. Oh, do you love me? Yes. They, you know, and they're looking for that validation and it works for them. Then that's fine too. Um, as long as they're like, you know, happy in their, in their relationship, they're, they're happy. But if people are experiencing relational problems, they're seeing that there's a pattern. They're maybe going through a lot of short term relationships. Their current relationship with their partner is very volatile it really helps to work towards earning a secure attachment. And the way that I work with people is, first of all, you know, it, it's individual, but I also, person, people that are, you know, fearfully attached versus people that are anxiously attached are going to need slightly different things. Right. But if I but just kind of summarize it, so it, it's going to be a combination of working through emotions on a deeper level and on a more superficial level, it's going to be working through beliefs. So on the superficial level, if you look at insecure attachment styles, you, you can kind of imagine a, a quadrant. So on, on one hand, it's going to be like, um, you know, how do I view myself? So if somebody views themselves, you know, it's kind of fundamentally unworthy of love, they have, they're struggling with low self-esteem, right? So, um, so that's one side. And then the other side is going to be how do people fundamentally view relationships? So some, you know, some people have an absolutely just negative view of relationships. They've never seen happy couples. They didn't grow up in a happy family, obviously. They haven't seen many happy relationships, many happy couples. So then they have these negative beliefs. So, and then... For example, like an, an anxious attached person actually might have positive views about relationships. They really want to be in a relationship. They're looking to create something beautiful, but they feel kind of insecure about themselves. Whereas an avoidant is, you know, the, the opposite. They feel pretty good about themselves, but pretty negative about relationships. And then the fearful folks, they're both. So they have negative views of relationships, they have negative views of themselves, and they use very um, disorganizing strategies. And so... N number one, like on a superficial level, is to identify all these beliefs and just to go through them, just to become aware of, you know, if this is how you think, this is how you think. Um, if there is a way to, to, to challenge that, is there a way to challenge it, um, you know, then, then we do. But if not, you know, this, the, the, just the awareness of your thought patterns and how it relates to what you are trying to build in your current relationship or what you see in your life in general is super important. And, and then on the deeper emotional level is I work with people um, to identify the various emotions that they're experiencing. So we're all kind of on a, uh, we all kind of have our, our, our daily, you know, kind of functional, um, you know, baseline emotions, like the, the vibration that we're on. And then in various situations, we experience various emotions. And sometimes we even block these emotions because we feel guilty for experiencing them. And sometimes the emotions that we're experiencing don't really portray to the moment at hand they come from the past. And so this, this creates a lot of confusion in people. And when people feel this level of confusion, they begin to create narratives. And these, these narratives, you know, tend to cause reactions. And these reactions tend to cause problems in relationships. Right. Now, the emotions that people are sometimes experiencing actually come, come from so far in the past. Like, they maybe have experienced something before the age of three. So before they can even use the words to name the emotions, before they can even make out what's happening with them. And, and these old stored emotions can come up in your life at the age of 33. And... Wow. 
Yes. And, it, you know, it can cause this confusion. So, you'd like, you know, people start to misattribute these emotions to other things that are happening now, right? And then create all these narratives. So it's about, on a deeper level, working through these emotional states and helping people deal with these emotions without even needing to make sense of them because sometimes you just won't make sense of them and so it's very so far you, you don't have a memory of this event you don't have a memory of what happened so unlike maybe something happens you know at seven or eight where the child feels an immense shame and then, then people carry it through their life that's you know you can kind of process it on a more cognitive level Whereas these deeper events, these deeper emotions, you can't use cognition, you can't practice logic, you can't use logic to process through them. You have to go deep into the body, you have to go into the soul. So I work with people to identify this. That's so cool. And it's crazy how much I'm learning right now because, you know, like, I've watched a couple of your videos on, on your Facebook page and like a lot of this stuff, you know, with toxic stress, adverse childhood experiences, insecure attachment, you, you mentioned the shadow side, which I've, I think I've maybe heard that before once, but I never really understood it. Now I kind of do, which is pretty exciting. But a lot of this stuff isn't mainstream information, you know, and, and growing up in a, in an alcoholic home, it's not uncommon, right? I mean, a lot of a lot of kids in, in, in a lot of countries grew up in homes that are unstable and scary and stressful because of alcohol addiction. And so many people become adults and we have all these really confusing feelings and uncomfortable feelings and odd reactions. And I mean, I know my partner and I, we both, we both come from this world and it's it's funny that you mentioned you know partners who both have insecure attachments and 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 we do and and they're slightly different and it's definitely a challenge but um it's also been a really cool um you know opportunity for us to work on that because we've had to work on that because that's the only way a relationship like that can work is if you're both really you know working on your attachment styles but um but we we've also noticed that we're really prone to stress responses and being you know caught up in these in these physical symptoms of stress and anxiety and and for a long time we didn't really understand them the way that we do now and and it's been a game changer um and and you know thank goodness there's people like you and people out there that are wanting to help people and and bring this information to life because i mean it's not it's not out there as much as it should be because you know this stuff can be really confusing when you're you know i'm a parent too and so like that's been a learning experience you know and i've even had to kind of explain to my daughter a little bit about mine and my partner's background just so she can kind of understand you know why we're the way we are um and yeah, it's, it's been, it's been quite an experience. So thank you for having this workshop. And, um, before we move on, I, I, um, so is the best place for people to find your, so it's called adult children of alcoholics workshop. And I found you on Facebook. Is that the best place to find what you're doing? Yes. So the workshop can be found at workshop for adult children of alcoholics.com. And then cool. I have a, a YouTube channel which I really just started and, and I'm working to develop it and we can maybe throw links it for people um, somewhere in the description if they're interested in finding that um, but I want to say it really kind of um, I, I really got a, a very warm feeling when you said you know you and your partner have an insecure attachment style and you're trying to work through it and Ah, oh, that's just wonderful. I'm very happy to hear that. And I have a feeling you guys are on a, on a good path. <laughs> it, it's, I actually just interviewed her this last weekend and, and released the, the video or the, um, the interview. And it was a very, 
wonderful experience, very powerful for our relationship, um, you know, where she told her story and she told about how she's, um, you know, working on what she went through and, 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 and everything. And yeah, it, it was really powerful for us. Um, so yeah, thank you. So real quick, if it, if it sounds like Sophia is in a, a subtropical setting, it's because she is. <laughs> I just found out she's actually um, in Mexico, which is which is really cool. Um, so if you hear birds and, and tropical sounds, that's why. And so you're you're publishing a book. Can can you talk about that? That's really exciting. So the, the book is um, it, it's also based on similar information that I provide in my workshop. Um, it's in eight chapters. It's both an information and a workbook for adult children of alcoholics. And the information part, you know, each chapter goes over some of the common things that adult children of alcoholics experience. They go into the science behind that. Uh, and then the, the, the worksheets um, are, uh, they come at the end of each chapter and they're exercises for people to do. So I recommend that people actually get a journal, get a little notebook that is dedicated just for this book and they can write out all the um, journal exercises. If they're, you know, if they're reading the book like in a, um, in a, um, like a Kindle format or something, so they can do all the journal exercises on the worksheets because it's one thing, you know, knowing the information and it's totally different um, working on it. And I absolutely recommend journaling and writing because sometimes people read things and they think about it through their minds and they think like, oh, I, I don't need to write this down. I already thought this through. Oh yeah, so they kind of scan it and they, but it's not the same. It's just not the same. You're just not going to receive the information, the one thing that you can do that is that you can do by yourself for yourself is journaling. And that is very powerful. And it's not the same thing as, you know, just sitting and thinking through it. So really like any kind of actionable, um, you know, if it's a self self help thing, something that's actionable, like journaling, at least um, also doing the meditation exercises and following all the steps you're putting action in in healing yourself and that action is what is going to rewire your brain. So reading stuff, learning stuff is great, but actually putting in action is going to really make the, the change. Um, so the so book, cool. is, yeah, it's both a workbook and information book. That's awesome. And, and that's really cool that it's actionable work and that it's based on science because, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a game changer for me was learning about what it means to have toxic stress and to have a dysregulated stress response, which is what people who come from persistent adversity can end up with. And, and you know, some of the symptoms of that, you know, our anxiety, our having a, a really sensitive stress trigger, things like that. And if you don't know this information, you would never know. Like I, you know, all my life, I never understood why I couldn't breathe. Like I just, I like, I felt like I was breathing through a stirring straw. You know, that, that's how I always felt all the way up until my like late twenties. And then I finally spoke to a psychiatrist and she talked to me about my childhood and she was like, you have complex PTSD. And she, and then I later learned through learning about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, you know, that a lot of this was from a dysregulated stress response and that changed everything for me. And I was like, okay, now I know I have a starting point. I know, you know, and then, and then from there you can learn information how to live with a dysregulated stress response. And like with what you're providing in this workbook, you know, knowledge is power, and then you're providing, you know, opportunities for action and for ways, like you said, to change your way of thinking and to sort of recondition, you know, neuroplasticity is probably another way of, of describing it. Um, and that's, and I mean, that's, to me, that sounds like a blueprint for recovery, right? 
Yes, yes. And, and the, the physical symptoms and how they're attached to our mental um, states of being, that's such an important topic. And it's so important Definitely. to get, get this out to people because it's something that people really don't know much about. And it's something that we just started discovering. So there's, there, there used to be such a big disconnect, right? And I think in the Western world, we're still living in this disconnect between mind and body. And but the truth is, is that, you know, intense emotional experiences, trauma, stress, dysregulate the nervous system. And in, in, in the nervous system, right, it's, it's essential for all your organs to work well, for your body to function well. And it's like you could be exercising and eating well and being so disciplined, but if your nervous system is dysregulated, um, things are just not working right. And, you know, this is where illness comes and... You know, also more on a psychological, I'm not a medical doctor, so more on the psychological perspective, there's a defense called somatization. And that is when people get sick a lot. And, you know, it really, it, it, they really do get sick. They get colds, they have all kinds of, you know, stomach viruses, stomach flus. But what it is, is a result of compound stress and also the body's way of basically shutting down. So if somebody is, you know, very hypervigilant, right, and hypervigilance, hypervigilance comes from, from a trauma response, like being raised in an alcoholic home, you, you build this hypervigilance, so everything that you do, you're kind of like overdoing it, you know, like regular tasks in which a person with a kind of a normal nervous system, they behave like very relaxed, you know, in whatever they're doing, they're conserving their energy, Whereas a person that has this hypervigil hypervigilance, they're always a little bit anxious. And so like a regular week or, you know, for, for somebody that's a little hypervigilant, it's really like much, much harder because the body doesn't press as much. And so then this kind of like compounds and compounds and the person really gets sick and the body says, you know what, I'm done. Like I need to not see anybody. I need to not get out of the house. I need to not do anything. So I'm just going to get sick right now and we're going to rest, you know, we're going to take a time out, we're going to rest. And that's actually, you know, a lot of people get sick. That, that used to happen to me. I used to get colds like five, six times a year. And then I realized like, yeah, I was like, hey, this is something, why I get colds, um, especially like before I have to do something very important. And sometimes it was like before I go on a vacation. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> But because I already like, you know, um, especially around vacation time, right? Like winter break and stuff. Um, like if you're working like a regular nine to five, like you already stress out so much before that by some point your body is like, I'm done. Yeah. You know, well, the body doesn't know you're going on vacation. It just tells right. you you have to stop. <laughs> so. Yeah. And it, and if if you take what we know about how ACEs affect us, you know, it makes a lot of sense that our immune systems would be compromised from not only when the actual adversity is happening. You know, when I was a kid, I was I, I was sick like all the time. And looking back, it's like, well, probably part of that was being in chronic flight or fight from a very unsafe and unstable home. So, but unfortunately that doesn't just go away, you know, like, and we end up with like these dysregulated stress responses with all these stress hormones in our brain, you know, more, more so than say someone who doesn't come from that experience. Um, and one of, and sadly, one of the, one of the consequences is, you know, autoimmune disorders, um, inflammation disorders, to name a few. And um, yeah, and probably being prone to a lot of um, illness, chronic illness included. So yeah, that's, um, I actually, I haven't thought about, I remember thinking about how it was odd, how sick I was. And I'm like, Hmm, I wonder if that's related now that you brought it up. I'm like, I sh I actually should look more into how kids who grew up in that environment are more prone to, you know, not just autoimmune and inflammation, disease, but also, you know, viruses and different things like that, because 
when the body is you know, so often in a, in a sympathetic response when it's under this persistent stress, I mean, there's probably not much, much capacity to fight off virus, right? I mean, to fight off like potential disease and stuff. So um, that's probably another one of the uh, health outcomes that can result from, from coming from an alcoholic home. Um, but yeah, anyway, moving on. So you're doing all this awesome work for people. You're coaching, you're, you're a clinical uh, doctoral candidate in, uh, in clinical psychology. How has all this, and obviously the workshop as well, how has all this helped you, this experience of learning all, all of this information and all these tools and, and everything? Oh, it has helped me immensely because, you know, I, when I started off on, on my own journey, it was just like going to psychotherapy, it was going to groups. Um, but once I actually started training uh, professionally and then, and then working with people, well, I think, you know, when we work with people as psychotherapists, we, we also sometimes pick up on things that are triggering to us, which opens even more doors and it opens even more kind of insight into our own consciousness. Like we experience, you know, a lot of triggering experience experiences. It's like, oh, what is that about? And so that actually, you know, you can't help but just do deeper work every time something like this comes up. That's one. And then two, just being in this world, you know, writing the book, doing more research, uh, learning more about it, thinking more about how to help people um, keeps me on a continual recovery. And I think that in, in cases, cases like ours, like you know, complex PTSD, this is really a lifelong process, right? And it's not just for complex PTSD, but generally people want to grow and they want to improve themselves, particularly for lifelong PTSD, it's a li lifelong process. Right. So even what we're talking about, like, you know, the, the, the physical states, the sort of antidote to that is doing the, um, you know, somatic therapy practices and learning good breathing practices and creating a mindfulness meditation practice and really taking time out for, for yourself to learn how to you know relax and also just finding what fits you um, and there's just so many there's so many tools out there there's so many things that we can do to help ourselves to relax to feel better physically to feel better emotionally and so doing this kind of work kind of keeps me on this journey I, I, I can't ever relax because I'm doing this day in and day out. And so it really, really keeps me very disciplined because I have to do what I preach as well. If I'm going to tell right. people to practice mindfulness meditation, if I'm not doing it myself, if I'm not taking those 20 minutes out of the day to do that myself, then it's like, you know, can't really teach this to people, right? And so I think that what it does is that a it opens up new new channels for me and like it helps me dig dig deeper but it also really keeps me uh, working consistently keeps me disciplined so yeah that's so cool so my next question was was going to be what recommendations do you have for people who grew up in persistent adversity but you kind of already answered a lot of that. Um, I mean, it, it, I mean, it sounds like, uh, we should probably get your, your book when it comes out. So where can we find that when it, when it's released? Um, I, uh, well, I'll, I'll send you the, I'll send you the book once it, it's released. And then also I'll, I'll, I'll mention it on my YouTube channel and probably publish it on my um, page as well. So I think okay, cool. when it comes out, I'll, I'll make it available on, on those links later you won't see it now but um once it's out uh but i i do have I, I still have tips and tricks just i mean i think you know over the past hour or so we talked about you know both relationships and uh, the physical aspect 
right? And then there's so many other aspects, but it would just take hours and hours to talk about this. Right. Um, so as far as relationships, I always tell folks, you cannot fix your relational problems unless you are in a relationship. The reason for that is because your attachment system is not activated. So if you're somewhere out there alone and you're not in a relationship, you're feeling perfectly fine and everything is wonderful and dandy and you think you're cured, that's only until you get into a relationship because you're feeling well as long as your attachment system is not activated. Once wow. you're Yeah. <laughs> this just blew my mind. I never heard that before in all the years of therapy I've had. Wow. Yeah. It's only when you find yourself back in that relationship, you're creating intimacy with somebody else, right. your attachment system is going to get activated and a lot of the same things that you've had trouble with, let's say in your past relationship, your, it's going to come up. It'll rear its ugly head. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Thank you. That, yeah, that was a, that was a mic drop moment right there. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, way to way to to end on a a mic drop. Yeah. Thanks so much. This has been awesome, Sophia. And so adult children of alcoholics workshop dot com is where people can find you. It's uh it's workshop for adult children of alcoholics. Workshop mm -hmm. for adult children of alcoholics dot com, which I will have a link to that and um, some of your YouTube videos as well or at least your YouTube channel on the show notes. And yeah, I can't wait for the book to come out. I, I it sounds so important and I think it's, it's going to help a lot of people. Uh, I'm so grateful that you're doing the awesome work you're doing. So thank you so much for spending your, your afternoon with me. Yeah. I likewise, I think your podcast is so wonderful and you're thank you. interviewing a lot of folks and getting this information out to the public as well. So good job. Thanks, Sophia. It's great to connect. You too. Okay. Bye.